Hey guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show. We give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today, Mark Ellis. Welcome everyone to the greatest damn show in the entire galaxy. Let's get rocked on this Monday where Batman vs. Superman week is finally here. So we're excited about that and a lot of cool things happening right here at Collider. Ashley, who's joining me today on this cavalcade of cinematic discussion? <laughs> <laughs> also here is John Schnapp. Yeah, can't wait. We watched all of Daredevil season uh, two, me and Dennis, uh, and then John Campia and Josh and Ellis were, were chimed in. It was a lot of fun. You could check all that stuff out on Collider right now. We did like little mini recaps is what we're calling yeah. them. So it's a lot to watch in, uh, in one weekend, but it was very enjoyable. <laughs> Bye. Hi. See ya. <laughs> also here is Josh McCuga. What's up, everybody? Big, uh, big day here. On uh, Collider, I don't want to. Oh, is it? Yeah, yeah, I wonder why you're on the show. I don't know. Hey, I'm I'll see you Dennis then. All right. I hope you guys had a fun filled weekend of watching Daredevil. A few announcements <laughs> here. I'm going to be like the principal at a, at a high school reading to the. Jack yeah, please right. come to the office. Um, first up, WonderCon. This weekend, we're going to be there. We have a Heroes panel. John Schnepp is hosting. Uh, John Campy will be there. Umberto, uh, Amy, Robert Meyer Burnett will be there. Yeah, Amy won't be there because oh, she's she out of town. Okay. But, yeah. uh, so everyone else, that's in a, at 730 in room 152. After that, we're going to have a meetup at 9 p.m. Uh, we finally locked down a place at the Lux Hotel. It's on Figueroa. I'm going to make a Facebook invite, and I'm going to tweet that out on my Twitter, and then I'm, I'm sure we'll have it on the Collider video as well. Look for that. That's going to have the address in, in 9 p.m. It's on the second floor bar there. A as uh, Mark mentioned, Batman v Superman week. We're going to be actually, mm -hmm. a bunch of us are going to be watching it on Tuesday night, which means we're going to do a non-spoilers version during movie, movie talk on Wednesday. We'll also shoot a spoilers version that will air on Friday. Uh, what else we got going on? A uh, little thing called, I mean, uh, Daredevil. John Schnepp mentioned that. Watch our, our little mini reviews on the website. And then Josh McCuga, uh, David Griffin, myself, Mark Ellis, and Sinead DeFries will be on TV Talk later tonight. And then one other show we have debuting this week. Mark Ellis, why don't you give the fans uh, what that show is? The movie trivia showdown, ladies and gentlemen. Y'all been tweeting don't, about don't. it. Everybody is very excited for this show where you pit two uh, maybe movie knowledgeable, maybe not that much YouTube <laughs> personalities. A lot of celebrities are going to be on the show in the coming weeks. First up, John Campia versus Dan Merle from Screen Junkies. It's going to be this Friday on the Collider YouTube channel. Make sure you guys weigh in with your thoughts on Twitter all this week at Collider Video and hashtag Schmodown because Ashley Mova is going to be reading some of your tweets during the show. That's Ashley Mova. The hashtag is Schmodown. She's going to be reading your tweets. It's going to be very, very exciting for everybody. We cannot wait to bring this weekly movie trivia bash to you guys. Uh, with all those announcements out of the way, I guess we'll talk about movies now. Ashley, <laughs> what's up first? Well, it's Monday, which means it's time for the weekend box office report brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. For the third week in a row, Disney Zootopia takes the number one spot, bringing in $38.1 million, officially crossing $200 million domestic and closing in on $600 million worldwide. Zootopia beat two new releases this weekend. The first, Allegiant the Divergent series, pulled in $29 million for the number two spot, with the other release, Miracles from Heaven, taking the number three spot with $15 million. 10 Cloverfield Lane was at the number four spot with 12.5 million and Deadpool took the number five spot with eight million. Mark, thoughts on this weekend's box office? Uh, I have a few of them, Ashley. I mean, look, if you want $15 million and you're not a starting quarterback in the NFL, make a faith-based movie. It's going to do very, <laughs> very well opening weekend. I think that's great. Miracles from Heaven sounded like a nice story, so I'm glad people checked it out, but Zootopia is still the big one to me. I was a little surprised that Allegiant didn't overtake it, not because I thought Allegiant was going to do better than his 29 million dollar take i think that's actually pretty good for what that franchise has become but zootopia man it declined about 25 percent in its third weekend which is an incredible number this thing keeps going and going and going it's the energizer bunny which there's probably an energizer bunny running around that <laughs> land and i think that it just speaks to the fact that there aren't a lot of other family options now maybe miracles from heaven some families went to go check out but zootopia seems like the right animated call for families to make until i maybe the jungle 
Jungle Book is coming out in a couple mm -hmm. weeks, but I don't know that anything this weekend other than Batman v Superman <laughs> is going to topple the family dollar that Zootopia is bringing in. Now, obviously, we know Batman v Superman is going to make a ton of money, so that's going to be number one. But Zootopia, congrats on a hell of a three-week run. Dennis, what stands out to you about these numbers? Uh, it, mostly Allegiant. It's the it, third film in the franchise. It 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 dropped over 40 percent not it's not a week to week thing but o over 40 percent of the last movie mm -hmm. which made i think 52 million dollars so that's a huge drop off that tells you about the 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 fan base and, and how passion i mean it's kind of waning off they saw the last movie and they're like you know what this is kind of going downhill uh zootopia i i'm happy for it i really like that movie and i'm glad that it was number one again it, yeah it's those family animated movies they just keep going and going and we know that juggernaut of batman v superman is coming this weekend but zootopia i think it's just going to keep on making money and as far as box office predictions some people tweeted me and say hey dennis you won you got five out of five i think the only reason i won was because i was the only one that remembered that <laughs> miracles from heaven was coming out <laughs> because it came out on a wednesday and and because i that knew is that the was lord's day out, yeah. so. <laughs> and so i put that in there and no one else put in there i think harlow had zero out of five so he, got, oh, he got the big donut that, well you know what that's probably why it's not on the show today um you're gonna see a lot of christian on the schmo down look i and and it's not a commentary on whether i think the divergent series is good movies or not i've only seen one out of three of them i saw insurgent didn't see the first divergent definitely missed the legion but it seems like the fan base that really cares about those movies you're still going out to see them and everybody else is like uh it's just not a phenomenon like they thought it might be a Hunger Games competitor, so that's why the lower numbers every time a new movie comes out. Schnapp, what, what, what do you see about this weekend's results that really stands out? Well, like you mentioned, I mean, me and Dennis, I, I have only seen Detergent once, and that was when we were in Atlanta, <laughs> so that's not really my Di thing. Divergent. Oh, did you Detergent. Detergent. <laughs> so whatever it's called. Um, Just Zootopia, that's hyphen awesome. Hyphen gent yeah. when you're there. Do your laundry and then see that movie. Um, <laughs> Yeah, Zootopia and the other family film, Deadpool. So it's, it's good to see both of those rounding out the top five. I think that's really great. I like seeing the 10 Cloverfield Lane is still in the mix. I really enjoyed it. A lot of people are had, eh, I didn't like the ending or whatever. Screw off. It's fun. <laughs> if you never saw Twilight Zone or Black Mirror, get a life. Check that out. Then you'll like t 10 Cloverfield Lane just a little bit more. So You know, speaking of detergent, your crawl shirt smells spring fresh. Yeah, <laughs> Josh, it's very What fresh. about you? You had a crazy weekend. Did you get to see a movie? Uh, I did not because I... I binged until my eyeballs fell out of my head, uh, Daredevil. I honestly think that a lot of people binging may have just like skipped the weekend oh, to watch sure. yeah. Daredevil. Guess what we did? We were here this weekend. <laughs> exactly. And, we and it, it was w worth it 100%. Yeah. I will say these movies, so you have Divergent, you have Hunger Games, and you have Maze Runner. If you put all of those in a hat and you didn't know it, and you, like you gave it to my mother, she wouldn't know what movie it was because they all seem to have like the same title just in different letter right. organization. Right. Um, it, I don't like these. It's all the same thing. Hot young twenties people <laughs> attacked by a force that we don't really know about in an earth we don't know about at a place that really we don't care about. And right. they just keep like punching us in the face with it. So I don't they're know. all trying to escape. Yeah. We're, we're, we're being constricted in this one environment that's yeah. not cool. Get out. Outside of the wall, there's something different. And then they get outside the wall, and there's like yeah. giant monsters that can attack right. you. I'm literally they're... describing my 20s when I lived right under the 101. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna go uh, Ashley, that's our box office report. What's our next story? On Friday, we learned that Maze Runner star Dylan O'Brien sustained serious injuries while filming a stunt for the final film in the trilogy, The Death Cure. Conflicting reports as to how exactly Brian got hurt were reported, with sources saying he either fell off a train or was run over by a car. On Saturday, however, original Maze Runner author James Dashner took to Twitter with an update saying that Dylan was hurt, but that his injuries were not life-threatening. He expects Dylan will make a full recovery. We here at Collider Video hope Dylan has a speedy recovery. Schnapp your thoughts on the set accident with Dylan O'Brien. It's always horrible to hear about set accidents. I mean, a lot of stunt people sometimes lose their lives while they're, you know, doing what they love doing, doing stunts in movies. And and mistakes happen all the time. I mean, we we, we know about the Sarah Jones horrible accident, a PA who, who, who died during an illegal train shooting. So it's of, that director is now in jail. He's serving time, like two years in jail, six years of probation, had to, had to plead guilty for, you know, putting his crew at risk. We don't know what the story is with this, but, you know, very glad that, you know he's going to be recovering because when we first heard about it none of us knew how how hard you know if it was like life-threatening or if it was critical condition but to hear the author come out and say that he's going to make a full recovery means that you know it's not like you know 
horrifying. He's probably hurt, but he's going to recover. Sort of like when Harrison Ford had, you know, part of the, you know, the Millennium Falcon fall on him and break his leg. That's horrible, and you don't want to hear about that stuff. But at least when you hear, no, it's going—they're going to have a full recovery. They're going to be able to. The least, the least of the news is them, you know, being able to continue filming. That's the least important yeah. thing. The most important thing is the kid's going to be okay. But you know, it's always horrible when you hear that. Yeah, I mean, with a guy like Dylan O'Brien, he's such a talented actor. Regardless of what you think of the Maze Runner movies as films, he is really, really good in everything he does. He's got a very bright future. So I was happy to hear that that's going to be able to continue. That while he was seriously injured, it's not life threatening. He is going to make a full recovery. That's the big takeaway from here but it speaks to something larger where you do wonder what the conditions of the set were because as much as you can ensure the safety of everybody around you there's a lot of insurance forms that people sign you just can't take care of everything all the time that sometimes something bad is going to happen by accident and one of the things that fans love hearing you brought up the Star Wars The Force Awakens is that we heard that they're going back to practical effects you're going to have real sets it's not going to be on a green screen one of the things whatever you think about heavy CGI movies with green screen Screen, it's a lot safer of an environment. So I'm not sure. The Maze Runner seem to have a lot of CGI, maybe practical sets in there as well. If you're trying to make a movie look so authentic, sometimes that can really up the risk factor for both stuntmen and real actors in there that are the stars of the movie. So this is going to obviously have huge implications for the Maze Runner movie. I don't know if it's going to be pushed back. I don't know how far it's going to be pushed back, what the delays are going to be like, whether there's going to be a lawsuit that comes out of something like this. But I mean, the big takeaway again is that Dylan O'Brien is okay and his career is going to continue at some point in the future. Josh, your thoughts? Yeah, I I think a lot of times people watch movies and TV and they and they see these stunts and, and they're like, oh, I mean, it's just movie magic. It's just TV magic. And when injuries like this happen, it kind of sheds light on the fact that, uh, yes, they're actors and they're getting paid a lot of money, but they're also putting their life on the line. Mm -hmm. And back to something that you said, he's the star of the movie. How is there not like a force field around this kid? Mm -hmm. how, how, you know, I, I just don't. You, you got to triple check these things. It's not like he's climbing. Uh, you know, he's rock climbing with Dan Cortez in an episode of Seinfeld. He, I mean, he's on Maze Runner. You know, you got to. There's got to be some sort of checks and balances here that wasn't checked. There will be a lawsuit. That's right, sure. uh, Dennis. Are you surprised? And what do you think the implications of this injury are going to be? I mean, it was terrible news. We heard it on Friday, but we're. It, you know, I'm happy to hear that he's going to be okay. I mean, and, and along with what Josh is saying, it is like we, we watch movies and TV, and because it's all make believe and we see it on the screen, we forget that it is actually a sometimes dangerous profession, especially for stuntmen and crew members, and once in a while, the lead actors who, you know, sometimes they, they know that they want it to be as authentic as possible. So they, they push towards practical effects, they probably push towards things that maybe a stunt man could do. Like, you know, you have Tom Cruise like doing a lot of crazy yeah. stunts, man. Yeah. And and the only reason he can get that done is because he's the producer of the film <laughs> mm -hmm. and you know what I mean? And so otherwise most most dudes would be like, no, 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 you don't do that. So yeah, I, I wonder what, what led to this, but I'm, I'm glad he's okay. He is someone that's kind of on the rise. I remember he was kind of my pick for the next Spider-Man. Right. That didn't happen because I think he was too old for what they were going for. But I think he, he is one of those guys that may be a, a big star in the future. I'm glad that this is maybe just a little setback versus something more permanent and damaging. And it's a nice reminder to all of us out there when we so praise actors and actresses for wanting to do their own stunts, like you brought up Tom Cruise, yeah. where it's like the guy's hanging on the side of an airplane. He's mm -hmm. on the tallest building in the world. I remember when Mission Impossible 2 came out, one of the things they were talking about during the promoting of that movie is that he literally almost fell off the cliff in the opening scene. He's hanging onto a rock and he could have let go and just fallen. Like there's no yeah. safety net there for that guy. So Don O'Brien, my big question, and I'm sure a lot of this is gonna come out, at this point, we don't even know if he fell off a train or got run over by a car, or maybe he fell off a train and got hit by a car. But was he actually performing a stunt? Was he like, no, I need to do this stunt, I'm the actor? Because it seems so easy to have a professional stuntman and you can just paint their face like Dylan O'Brien mm -hmm. and boom, the scene's done and it's mm -hmm. in the can. So I wonder if he was fully aware of how dangerous it was, what the situation was. We're sure to get more details to you guys as we hear more about this story. Uh, Ashley, let's move on. THR is reporting that longtime Steven Spielberg collaborator David Kep has been hired to write the fifth installment of the Indiana Jones franchise for Disney and Lucasfilm. The Jurassic Park and Kingdom of the Crystal Skull scribe will work with Spielberg and Kathleen Kennedy on the direction of the script, which will see Harrison Ford reprising his role as the famous archaeologist. This latest sequel is unique in that George Lucas, who came up with the story ideas behind the previous four Indiana Jones films, will not be involved. Production could get 
get underway as soon as next summer with a release date set for July 19, 2019. Dennis, thoughts on David Kep writing Indiana Jones 5? Uh, I'm not sure how to feel about this. I, I mean, I don't know exactly how involved he was. Obviously, George Lucas was involved with the Kingdom of the Crystal Skulls. He's written some scripts that weren't so good. He wrote uh, lo- Jurassic Park, The Lost World, Snake Eyes. But then on the other hand, he wrote the first Jurassic Park, the first Spider-Man, and then what I call Die Hard in Prep School, Toy Soldiers. Yes! So, I don't know. Yes. It's really hard to get a pinpoint on on this guy's writing ability because he has some good ones and he has some not so good ones. If you guys have never seen Toy Soldiers, make sure you check it out because all these kids, they go to a rich boarding school and then what happens? Terrorists take it over and only a small group of the renegade students, including Sean Astin Sean and Astin. Will Wheaton, <laughs> can overtake them. It's a hell of a movie written by David Kep. And then something on a slightly bigger scale, Dennis, would be the Indiana Jones franchise and seeing this news look it's always going to stand out to me when it says that George Lucas is not going to be involved in this and I'm yes I think it's probably the right decision but it's just weird to hear that George Lucas is in no way involved with an Indiana Jones film going forward I think David Kep is the right guy to do this and at least start the writing process because there's nothing guaranteed that says he's going to write something and we have to take everything that he writes and put it on screen there might be a lot of treatments on this thing going around a lot of people might take a pass at this thing Having David Kep be the guy that starts to lay the foundation, I think is probably the right call at this juncture. Josh, what do you think? Yeah, I I know I might get a little bit of hate for this, but I kind of feel bad for George Lucas a little bit. Like every time one of his franchises gets re up, they're like, listen, George, we know that you got the team this far, but we're going to bring in a new guy uh, that's going to take us to the championship. I <laughs> I just, I, I, that, that being said, David Kep. Uh, uh, Schnapp and I, before we, we got on air, we're looking at his credits. I mean, he his is like a EKG. It's yeah. Indiana Jones for premium rush. You know, I don't know. Uh, again, if, if he's collaborating with Spielberg and Kathleen Kennedy, hopefully they're going to push him in the right direction. And, and he has somebody in the writer's room saying, I wouldn't exactly do that. Let's not put aliens in a cave and f- dancing beetles uh, in the thing. Because Indiana Jones is my favorite franchise. I, I, I'm Star Wars is amazing. I know you guys all love that, and everybody has their own. For, but Indiana Jones was mine. When I walked out of Crystal Skull, it, they it took all my toys, threw them in the sewer, and my mom made me go to prep school and like be an engineer. <laughs> Did the prep I, school get taken over by, 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 by terrorists? And Louis Gossett Jr. came to <laughs> save him. <laughs> and I know you said Die Hard in a prep school, but I always called it Red Dawn in a prep school. Damn, so, I like that. Yeah, uh, but I, I let's give him the chance. Maybe he can re- reignite that toy soldier magic and bring it to Indiana Jones. I hope so. Schnapp, what's your take? Is David kept the right guy? And if he's not, who else should be in there? Let's see. What else did David kept right? Oh, that's right. Indiana Jones and this crystal kingdom of whatever the <laughs> hell that is. I don't get it. I mean, you're right. Like we're looking at his credits. He's done. He's written a lot of stuff. Writing any kind of screenplay is a collaborative effort. I know George Lucas wanted, you know, wanted to get those aliens in there. <laughs> and I know they pulled from three or four different scripts. They pulled like the entire opening sequence with the nuke the fridge scene. That's Frank Darabont. A lot mm-hmm. of people don't know, don't know that, but that was his thing. A lot of the contributions are pulled from all over the place. Mm-hmm. David Kep gets his name on the screenplay, but a lot of other people's hands are in that pie. It's really hard to tell, like, you know, even if his name is only the sole screenplay credit, there's all these other people who are involved in the ideas and the stories. And so with all that, I get, I don't like that he's writing this new one because of the this Crystal Skull uh, disaster. I, mm-hmm. I, too, when I walked out of that theater, was like, wow, I felt like the Phantom Menace kind of thing where I'm yeah. like, I can't believe. Because some of my friends who saw were like, wasn't that great? And I was like, sorry, dude, no. didn't drink that Kool-Aid, yo. Yeah. I thought it sucked. Yeah. And that's right after I saw it. I, it's a horrible film, and I hate saying that because I, like you, love Indiana Jones, and I love those three films. I saw Raiders of the Lost Ark totally as a little kid sneaking in to see it. Yeah. We had just seen like one of the other, like whatever space adventure was out. Me and my friend were like, Let's, Han Solo's in this. Let's go see it. We just walked into the theater right when the movie began. It was awesome. like... Bam, my head exploded. I mean, I ruined an entire family vacation because I bought a bullwhip and I cracked it on my brother and he had to get stitches. That, like, that's <laughs> yeah. how much I love it. No, I mean, Jones. so, yeah, I got to, you know, I, I'm not really that excited about, you know, David Kep. And not saying he's a bad writer, but it's just like because he wrote that last one, I just wish they would have given it to someone else, you know. One of the oldest adages in life is never give Josh McCuga a bullwhip. <laughs> well, <laughs> make sure you guys hop in the comment section right now. If you're watching us live, the chat room is exploding. Let us know, is David Kep the right guy? to write Indiana Jones 5 and if he's not who do you want to throw in there and make sure you comment on this afterwards if you catch us 
on YouTube. Now it's time for buy or sell. This is the part of the show where Ashley's going to present us with a topic, and then we're going to say whether we buy it or sell it. Buying is good. Selling is bad. <laughs> Let's throw some money out. With Zack Snyder staying busy in the world of DC, with Batman vs. Superman Dawn of Justice, and the upcoming Justice League Part 1, fans of the 300 franchise have wondered if there would ever be more movies in the series. In an exclusive interview with our very own Steve Frosty Weintraub on Collider.com, Snyder confirmed that he has had discussions with Warner Brothers to keep the 300 films going, saying... We've been talking a lot about sort of different incarnations of 300. We've been talking about is there a way possibly we move out of ancient Greece and use it as a framing device for other conflicts that happen throughout history. Snyder then mentioned the Revolutionary War, the Alamo, and a battle in China are current concepts they're discussing as possible movies in the 300 style of storytelling. Josh, buy or sell more moves in the 300 franchise. I don't, this is like, I guess, a weak sell. I'm not, I liked the first one. It was good. Like, the effects were pretty amazing. Uh, Gerard Butler's abs could, you know, they're, they're fantastic. <laughs> and then the second one, I don't know, like, if I really liked it at all, uh, I kind of feel like I, like, slept through a little bit of it. I, I like the idea of maybe taking it away from, like, ancient Greece in, in, a, in a cooler, uh, we haven't really seen an amazing Alamo movie ever. I'd love to see it in that sort of vein. But if you go there, that, like, that, that stylistic approach may take away from some of that. Again, just a week so. Yeah, I, I, this is very, very hard because I feel like Ashley's trying to sell me a bulk of 300 movies mm. where I have to buy all of them or I can't buy any of them. Like I'm at Costco <laughs> and I can't just buy one 300 movie in a different time period and see if I like it or not. This is going to be a very, very weak buy for me mm. because I do want to see how this framing device translates into other conflicts throughout history. I want to see what the Revolutionary War looks like. Let's take it back to the Robin Hood days. Let's put it in, let's put it in more modern times. Let's have a Def Leppard concert tour bus <laughs> with 300 style on it. That would be awesome, but I need to see one of them before I can say whether we should keep doing this because I know that there's a lot of history professors that hate 300 and what that did to their favorite time period ever. So to see this in something that maybe is a little more palatable to us, that's a little more recent, do we want to see this? Because there's been a lot of great war movies made about, say, World War II. So would you want to see the storming of the beaches at Normandy done in a 300 style to me visually it sounds very very appealing but you might have to put more of a focus on the story than what Zack Snyder and the 300 team have done with their first two movies thus far schnapp you buying you selling man I'm buying this big time yo remember a blink and <laughs> vampire hunter now we got some possibilities right 300 Washington's revenge oh just seeing Washington <laughs> jump in slow motion oh and he pulls out his wooden teeth at the same time and throws them like ninja stars it's like choo, 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 choo. The Washington imagination of this giant man, man is just incredible. Washington's superpowers. I like cannot tell a lie. I'm about yeah. to kick your Stop! ass. Stop! <laughs> uh, Snyder, you sold me. I want to see Washington in like a super action, like 300 freak fast, man. He I, has spears from cherry blossom trees. Yeah, I just, it, every single one should just have be called 300, even though it has nothing to do with the 300 Spartans. But what it's telling you is it's going to be an extreme action rendition. And I like it. It's like, why not have fun with the past? I mean, uh -huh. you know what? Read your history books, learn about the past, and then you won't you won't believe these movies as as fact. You'll have you'll have a little more fun. Vampire hunting with Lincoln, it just wasn't a good movie. If you were able to do a good movie version of that, maybe everyone would have enjoyed it. You have that chance for 300, like, cinema. What is it going to be? Because the 300 verse, what is it going to be? I buy it. They turned the crossing of the Delaware into, like, a naval battle in the, in the Revolutionary War. I love it. Ben Franklin getting pissed off, slowly taking off his monocle, standing yes. up to see huge jabs, <laughs> flying a kite in the rain, yeah. shooting electricity at people. Yes. Dennis, we're writing a pretty Dennis good movie is on here. Right, yeah. buy yourself. I want to so, see it. So I buy Schnepp's version of this, <laughs> right? But in terms of this one, I'm actually selling it. It, 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 it You know what? I'm selling it because it smells of what, what what happened with the Cloverfield franchise. Mm. It's it's where we're getting dangerously close to now making movies that are kind of related to other ones, right? So Cloverfield, you know, they they put that name on there because they wanted to sell movie tickets. It originally was called The Cellar. We talked about like two or three years ago on mm -hmm. AMC. Um, and it had nothing to do with it. They slapped on the name. It made way more money than it would have if it had the name The Seller. And this is what 300's doing. They're gonna like slap the 300 brand on it. 
and have it kind of like related. They use the same style or whatnot. So that's why I'm selling it. I mean, 300 was it was the amount of soldiers that were competing in that first battle. Yeah, right? yeah and then they put yeah. 300 because the second movie, Rise of an Empire, still had to do with that battle. I it was I more can't like imagine 550 in the yeah. second. Yeah. It's, of course, 300 seconds of Eva Green naked. Yeah. That's what what I if remember. they just put the exact amount of soldiers that were involved in like every battle? Right. So if it's like sometimes the movie's called 18, sometimes the movie's <laughs> called like 38,000. Like it'd be it. But again, the 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 intriguing factor of seeing a Gettysburg movie done in the 300 style. I was just going to go Gettysburg. <laughs> yeah. don't want to that's the way it. to get Lincoln back in there. Uh, yeah. A little yeah. bit. Come to our meet and greet at Wonder Gun this week. <laughs> and that's, what we're all, that's, all, that's all we're going to talk about. <laughs> yeah. like, about how I watch the best George Washington cosplay yeah. Yeah. with yeah. a wooden teeth shurikens. <laughs> Either come ready to pitch a 300 movie or don't show up at all. <laughs> that's the call. Vasco da Gama 300. <laughs> Ashley, we are done with buy ourselves. No, we actually have one more. Let's we talk do. about it. Steve Weintraub was all also able to speak with Zack Snyder about some of the villains in the Batman vs. Superman, specifically asking if the Joker was close to making an appearance in the movie. Snyder confirmed that not only was the Joker close to being in the movie, but that another Batman villain, the Riddler, was also close to making an appearance. Snyder explained that while working on the script with screenwriter Chris Terrio, their mythological presence was felt, but that he didn't want to get his eye too far off the ball because he needed to spend time on the center conflict of Batman and Superman. Mark buyer sell appearances by the Joker and the Riddler in Batman versus Superman. Ooh, well, I buy that it probably was getting close, but I'm going to sell that they should have appeared in the movie because this movie is two and a half hours <laughs> is the reported running time, and then we're going to find out just how crammed with superheroes and villains it is when I get to see it tomorrow night. Sorry to make everybody else out there jealous. Um, I'm very excited about where this movie is going, the direction it is, but remember, this movie started out as Man of Steel 2, then it became Batman v Superman so you're putting Batman in there and from the trailers it looks like we're getting a heavy dose of Batman what his history was what his future is going to be going against this alien and then obviously it's called Dawn of Justice for a reason because there's other members of the Justice League so that is so much more than anything I would ever hope to have in one movie to begin with so to put the Riddler and the Joker in there even if it just for a little bit seems like a little bit of overkill and I think more so than that it might have wreaked a little bit of desperation where they're just trying to sell us on familiar characters and I'm glad that they're not relying on that. I think the worst thing you could have seen in a Batman versus Superman trailer is throwing it, oh, and look, don't worry, we have the Riddler and we have the Joker and Doomsday and Wonder Woman and Lex Luthor and maybe Aquaman and the Flash. Just <laughs> way too much to chew on. I love the Riddler and the Joker as villains. I just don't think that they belonged in this movie because, again, it's called Dawn of Justice, but it's also called Batman versus Superman. Schnepp, what do you got? This is Gotham, right? Um, <laughs> I was gonna say this is America. Uh, with George Washington. Uh, they made a Batman uh, movie in the kick 300 somebody style. into the river. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah. it's not bad. Slow motion. Not a bad idea. I want to see that. Force just under yeah. fire in Washington on top of a building. Kicking someone off something. <laughs> Betsy oh, Ross yeah. so in the flat. <laughs> Real savage <laughs> style. She's getting that star on there. Anyway, Joker <laughs> and the Riddler. You know what? I swear to God, I think the Joker is in it in a flashback form, and he might have gotten excised, and now he's in the R-rated edition because he's just beating Robin to death, and they're like, that's a little too savage. I'm, I'm, I feel that. I think that they shot Jared Leto and that the Joker's in there, mm. and maybe he's just in the R-rated special edition because that'll sell. That's a lot more hotcakes, you know, mm. if you're like, hey, the Joker's in the R-rated edition. But uh, yeah, the Riddler, I know some pictures came out when they, that very first trailer, you saw little green question marks mm -hmm. in the background. So I think they are gonna hint at Batman's legacy because he, he's been Batman for a while. He's put a lot of people in Arkham. So why wouldn't you hint at like the different people? You already know that you know Robin's dead and he's got like, you know, spray painted like ha ha's and everything. So the Joker is around and probably taunting Batman. So like they said, that they're there peripherally, whether we actually have a scene of the Joker in this version or not, I don't think so. And I, I buy it, you know, I think it's a good idea to not cram as many characters in as possible. Remember the Avengers work and that had like way more character, name brand characters than this movie does, so. So you're selling what that they should have been in the movie. They no, should I mean, not, I, their mythological presence is gonna be felt yeah, for them I think actually it's popping in the movie. I would think that 
I still feel Joker is going to show up in a flashback scene. Ooh, mm. Oh, boy. Dennis, what do you got? Uh, yeah, I'm going to buy Joker and sell Riddler. With Joker, hmm. it, it is, it's going to be more, or, or I mean, it's not in the movie, but if they had him, it would have been or, more or, organically woven into the storyline. Mm-hmm. Like you said, with the Robin suit, uh, I, Joker always plays a big part in Batman's story. We pro, you know we know that he's going to be in Suicide Squad. We know Batman's going to make a cameo in there. Right. He's, ma- he's probably going to be the main villain in the Batman solo film. Riddler, I think it, that would be what Mark is talking about, where it must have felt it would feel like he, they sh- they're shoving him in there just to have him. It's cool that they're hinting towards him, and I, w- I wouldn't mind seeing him in a later Batman film, but right now I, I, I just don't want him in there. Uh, Joker, yeah, I, I could see him still in a post credit scene. Mm. I could see Jared Leto in some sort of post credit scene that they're going to play, and that way they can sell us on Suicide Squad at the end of Batman sure. v Superman. That's right. Now, we're all seeing Batman v Superman Tuesday night. Uh, Josh, you're seeing it like what, Friday? Um, <laughs> oh, what do you oh, think man. about this story? Uh, <laughs> that was my Joker. <laughs> uh, I think, uh, okay, so you have the Suicide Squad coming up. And they knew that was coming. Mm-hmm. Right. So I don't think they wanted to like jam these other guys down your throat because they are going to have this awesome movie and then that going forward. Now, that doesn't mean that I think there's going to be like 30,000 Easter eggs in Batman versus Superman. Mm-hmm. Like they're going to be everywhere. There's going to be a guy in there like doing a, a blog like, oh, I cut it at minute, you know, and he's going to release that whole <laughs> yeah. thing. That guy is going to be awesome. Um, and I think that, that the greatest part about what this Batman v Superman is, is I think we're like you said, it was Superman 2. So it's going to be mostly a Superman movie with a lovable villain as Batman, like a guy that we, we know to love. And then the movie goes forward with, you know, Justice League kind of stuff. I don't think, again, we're going to see Doomsday. So I don't think you need to shove a Batman villain when we're getting Superman films. You know, you and I were out Saturday night getting giddy over both this and Daredevil. And yeah. one of the things that you bring up, I think is a great point, is that Joker is such a selling point for Suicide Squad. Mm-hmm. So whether he's in Batman v Superman, just in a very brief like flashback cameo or not, I'm totally cool if they do that. I don't think it's going to happen, but if they did it, I'm fine with that the fact that they didn't put joker in any marketing campaigns if he is indeed in the film is a very smart play Mm -hmm. because then you save your big what does jared leto look like as the joker reveal for suicide squad a movie that isn't as well known a property as something starring batman versus superman so you need him that's your starting ace for suicide squad i think it was the right move to do things that way well that is it for buy or sell so now we're going to move on to mailbag but we want to remind you guys at the end of this here program we're going to take some of your live Twitter questions. So make sure you guys tweet us at Collider Video. Ashley is going to be the gatekeeper today. So make sure you be extra specially nice to her. And if you want to guys get one of your mailbags right on the show, just write us at collidervideo at gmail.com. Take a cue from the three we got today. What's up first? Gino Nechef writes, Hello, Collider crew. I love the positive direction you're going in, even after John moving on. My question is about how trailers are made. Do the people see all the footage shot and use that, or do they see the whole movie and cut it up based on what they think will be played better in a minute 30 to 30? Thanks. Well, that is a great reason to apply for a job at Trailer Park or any of the other (laughs) facilities that cut trailers is whether you get to see the entire movie months and months ahead of time. Unfortunately, I don't think that's the case. But my take on it is that it's every trailer is going to be different so if you have these huge blockbusters that have a shroud of secrecy over them whether it's force awakens or it's batman versus superman or civil war you're going to get some footage you're going to get the footage that the studio wants to use to sell their brand at that particular time whether it's going to be a teaser trailer one trailer two and then it's the job of whoever is editing and cutting the trailer to put that footage in and then get approval by the studio with a smaller movie maybe you do get to see the whole movie ahead of time and maybe you're you get to collaborate a little bit more with the studio as far as what you want in there and what would be the best way to sell your movie because I look at trailers as two and a half minute pieces of art I love watching trailers sometimes they're way better than the movie The Village remember that Great trailer. (laughs) It's not talking about the movie. So I think it's an important role that they play in selling the movie and in being something special to watch on their own and it is a worthy endeavor to get into. Dennis? Trailers. How yeah, do they get made? yeah. It's it's like you said. It's it's a post production facility that's that's geared and specialized just to make trailers. It's not mm-hmm. the people who are editing the movie that make these trailers, and they don't get to watch the whole movie. It's like some PR company, marketing firm. They watch a rough cut. They deal with the director and the studios, and then they choose out the sound bites and then the visuals that they want to show. They give them like a big handful of them, and then they piece it together from there. But it's yeah, it's it's an art in and to itself. 
Josh? Yeah, I, I worked uh, briefly. A buddy of mine still works at a, a company that makes trailers, and it's uh, it's an unbelievable kind of process. Is a lot of people ask when they see the credits, like, what does a second assistant director do? Uh, a second direct, second assistant director has a lot of jobs, but he also takes notes on things that he would think would be good in the trailer. Then you have marketing executives that get clips based from the director and the producer, only things that they would want people to see in the trailer. Then you have the studio heads that go, and then they send that footage to a trailer house raw and uncut, basically, just like the dialogue. The sound isn't there. And then these people take it's you know, they take it, put it on a canvas and then just paint a perfect picture with it. It's an it's, it really is. There's so much more that goes into trailers than we actually know. Schnapp, you're a director. You make a piece of content. You really care about what you just crafted. Would you trust somebody in a post-production facility like a trailer park or something else to handle your baby with care? On a large budget production, yes. On a small pr budget production, no. Like for the for the trailers, me and uh, the other editor, Marie, cut our trailers for our film because we knew what we wanted to tell. We we knew what we wanted to reveal, and it's in that way you're sculpting the what the the little mini version of the movie is to entice people to see the full version. Uh, I think a lot of uh, bigger companies now, outside of Star Wars, I think Star Wars like you, you that's a really good example of how. None of that footage was sent anywhere, and that was like all in-house. That entire, all of those trailers were were made very decisively, and they just revealed just a little bit more of the same first scenes that they revealed in that very first, like you know, Chewie were home trailer. Like you always, you just always saw just a little bit more of the Millennium Falcon on Tatooine, or just a little bit more of inside the Millennium Falcon. Just so that kind of thing. They're doing the same thing with Batman v Superman, and when they did do that big reveal, is she with you? I thought she was with you. You know, heads were rolled because the reaction to that trailer was so negative. They were like, mm, you're not doing this anymore. How about you do this? And a whole new team was put on, at least right. as far as what I know, to put all these newer, the newer Batman v Superman trailers, which put the movie back on track as far as what the audience wanted, which was seemed, it seems kind of easy to say, why are you showing all this stuff? Keep it to Batman v Superman. But a lot of studios freak out when they have such like a hundred or 200, even $300 million film where they're like, show them everything, show them the end. Like I remember, <laughs> no, I swear to God, Men in Black was the first trailer that I remember seeing where they showed right. the ending. They showed that UFO landing with the two Men in Black holding their guns. Yeah. And I was like, in the theater, I was like, they just showed the ending. Yeah. I knew it was the ending, I felt it, because it was like, that's such a big budget spectacle. Mm -hmm. It would have been great if they flipped it and that's how the movie began. Then right. I would have been like, wow, that's some balls. But no, a lot of times they just try to give you a mini version of the movie. But why do they do that? Because it show, they, they can tell that works. If yeah. you show everyone, a, like, oh, we're gonna get every, all that, I'll go see it. People like us, we don't wanna see, see all those spoilers, but unfortunately for a larger mass audience, they'd rather see a lot of little scenes. Yeah. That's right. I mean, look, we're huge fans of trailers here. We actually do a lot of reaction slash reviews on the Collider Video YouTube channel. You guys out there in cyberspace, comment and let us know, what are your favorite trailers of all time? What's the trailer that really got you into the mood of whatever movie you're going to see? Do you guys have any at the top of your head, like an all-time great trailer? Well, like 90s and then into the 2000s, you were still getting the inner world guy, Yeah. yeah. right? Uh, if you guys go back and watch the Cobra trailer, the Stallone movie, oh, it's an amazing trailer. Watch the Predator trailer, too, Predator. because it's just Schwarzenegger, and he's yeah. going up against an alien this time. Yeah. See you this theater. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I think my all-time favorite trailer ever is just because it was like hit me right at the right age with Vampire Strikes Back. Like I was already like foaming at the mouth because I had uh -huh. seen Star Wars, and then the that I, who would have ever thought you'd see the return of Darth Vader and like right. him jumping with a lightsaber to fight Luke and the Millennium Falcon flying around with the asteroid with that music, freaked me out. That's why I saw it so many times in the theater because it just like instantly was like I can't wait to see that. Like mm -hmm. for a year, like I think the trailer came out a year early, so you're right. just you're just going to see movies just to see the trailer. On yeah. the flip side of that, Lord of the Rings, Fellowship of the Ring, an awful trailer, but the movie was kick ass. Mm. So, I, I don't know. Dennis, what do you got for a contender as far as greatest trailer you've ever seen? Oh, I don't know. I mean, there's so many good ones. I know the last great one I saw was that Mad Max one. Uh, I think it was the second one. I, I can't remember. Yes, the second one where it was, it was just, just like the, the classical big. music yeah. and all the, the, like, it was like a controlled chaos, all the shots, and it was like, it told you exact. So when I saw the movie, I was like, this is exactly what I was expecting because yes. that trailer didn't reveal too much. But at the same time, it gave me the tone and feel of how it was going to be, and I loved every minute. Yeah, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of good ones in the chat room right now. You got Inception, a lot of people are saying. Uh, the Social Network, which which I thought was a great trailer, but I just didn't like the, the choir singing Radiohead. Yeah, yeah. I thought that was kind of 
odd to me. My favorite trailer to this day, I still think, is Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace. <laughs> that first teaser that came out was just so good and captivating, and I could not believe Star Wars was back. And then you see the double-sided lightsaber. It was a pretty sweet trailer. It's too bad it was full of lies. <laughs> you know, I, you know I, what I, was a, most recently was a trailer that everybody talked about how it kind of ruined the movie was Southpaw. We saw the we right. saw like the main plot yes. points of Southpaw. I was like. I don't need to see this movie. That's exactly why I didn't see the movie. Because when we saw the trailer, I was like, I just saw the entire movie. Sam McAdams dies, he comes back. Sometimes sometimes you think that it's going to be telling you the whole movie. Like The Martian, I thought, told me the whole movie. But it ended up, I still think that trailer gave away way too much. But it ended up still being a worthwhile theater experience. Okay, Ashley, what's next in the mailbox? DC Bowling writes, Disney movies have been coming and going for the past and present for decades. And there are some times where some people have forgotten or didn't like the first time around, but grew a better appreciation later. My question is, what animated or live action Disney movies do you guys feel are underappreciated? Thanks and keep pumping up the volume. Okay, pump Christian volume. Slater. Thanks for writing that one. <laughs> yeah. Now look, I have my two horses that I will always say are two of the, not just underrated, but the best Disney movies of all time. But if anything, I am not a shoot first point guard. I distribute the ball around. So I'm <laughs> going to throw it guard. to you guys. But if you guys take my movies, I will weep about it openly. Dennis, you're up first. Uh, I have for the animated side, I have uh, The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Ooh, and Mulan. I think those two are underrated. For live action, I have Enchanted. That was the one with Amy Adams, yes. Patrick Dempsey, mm. and uh, James Marsden. Who were you in that movie? I was a, a right behind her when she uh, she stepped on a midget in New York City, and I was like, "Hey, watch it!" That was nice. That's nice. Cool. Did you uh, did she know you were right behind her? Or was that like a? Uh, <laughs> that were, was you, a were you actually in extra, the movie, or yeah. were you uh, someone walking was, on the streets of New York that just happened to get into? the I movie? was a well placed extra. Okay. Then. Nice. Fun fact: when you watch extra. Three Men and a Baby, Josh McCook is the dead kid. Yeah. in the oh. window. <laughs> Whoa, Whoa! What do you Lord. got for your favorite? It's a cardboard cutout of Ted Danson. It's not real. It was an urban legend. It's why the internet ruins fun. Can't believe you Jeff, went to the dead baby got? thing. I, what do I got? Um, it's not a let's dead see. Baby. For, it was yeah. a dead kid. Dead kid, dead baby. Much Same different. thing, right? They're, youth. It all goes so quick. Black Hole, live action. I want to see Maximilian and Vincent, old Bob, back on that. You know the what was it? The Cygnus. Maximilian, come on, guys. You guys, they're too. They're too young. So it's a film that came out in the eighties. Bad. And didn't make a lot of money. It's called The Black Hole. So that's a live action one. Animation, I'm going to say The Black Cauldron, but just I think a day or two ago, yeah. they announced that they're actually using the original books and going with that and doing a live action new series, like a trilogy. So those are my two. If the crawl shirt didn't hook you, The Black <laughs> Hole will. Hell Josh yeah. McCougar, what do you got? Favorite underrated Disney flicks? Uh, I don't really have a live action one, but I do have an animated one, and it's the, the original Robin Hood that they yeah, did. That was one of mine. God, mm-hmm. it was one of mine. I love, I had that taped off TV on a VHS. Mm-hmm. It's like a childhood thing. My brother and I used to watch all the time. My dad loved it. Uh, just really cool. The fox plays Robin Hood. The king is the lion. He's It's all these old-timey voice actors. I mean, it's 1973, I think that movie came out. Mm-hmm. Just really really well done. Remember the shaggy dog that was in the archery competition and he lines up and he's got his like ears are flapping and so he's just blows it up yeah, uh-huh. and he can shoot it really yeah. well. Uh, yeah. So I had Robin Hood is that mm-hmm. one. I think that came out in 1973 originally. Yeah. We also had a VHS copy. Yes. And the sword in the stone. Mm. Oh Ugh. my God, the legend of Arthur has never been told better unless maybe Monty Python and the Holy Grail. But that one was on repeat in the Ellis VCR in the late 80s. Loved, loved, loved the sword in the stone. Check it out. And I would get in trouble with my girlfriend if I didn't mention the Aristocats and Oliver and Company and the Fox and the Hound. It'll make you cry the best tears. <laughs> Ashley, what's our last question in the mailbag? Harry Green writes, hey, can fans send our questions about television shows for the upcoming Collider TV show to collidervideo at gmail.com? That's a great question, and I'm not sure that I know the answer to it. <laughs> Why don't I throw it over to Josh McCuga, who is the alleged host of TV Talk later today. Yes, they handed me the reins to the show, and I will drive it straight into the bowels of hell. Oh, no, dear um, no, guys, uh, we're just going to do a Twitter questions, so you can uh, hashtag it Collider TV Talk, send it to me to Collider Video uh, any time uh, of the week, day, time, whatever. Uh, if we like it, we'll read it on the air And because um, the show won't be live right now, but I will be just collecting all of your Twitter questions all week long. So uh, hashtag at Collider TV Talk and look forward to what you guys have to say. Hashtag Collider TV Talk the same way that like for Jedi Council, you just hashtag Col- uh, Je- Jedi Council. And then that's Collider. How you, Collider. Is it Collider Jedi, Jedi Council? Yeah. Collider Heroes? Yeah. That way, just just use the hashtag. It's really good for kids in the new millennium. <laughs> um, yeah. Let's move on. Speaking of hashtags, to Twitter. Ashley is now going to take some of you guys live Twitter questions. What's up first? Marco P writes, what are your opinions on the Sam Raimi Spider-Man trilogy? Love you guys. 
The Sam Raimi Spider-Man trilogy. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people have a lot of opinions on it. I can't wait to read y'all's. Mine <laughs> is that I think that the first two movies are very, very good. I remember hearing, not thinking personally, but hearing everybody else say that Spider-Man 2 is an all-time great comic book movie. I really liked it when I saw it. I caught it recently. I didn't think it holds up as well as some other comic book movies have over a decade, but I think that Spider-Man 3 had a lot going for it going into it, and it really just fell apart. It got a little too bloated. You had some crazy scenes in there. I can forgive like a goth dancing Tobey Maguire in that movie. What mm -hmm. I can't forgive is way Wasting Venom in a movie that didn't need him. You right, take yeah. out Sandman, you give us all of Venom, or Sandman was a villain that could have carried you through that movie. But the first two Spider-Man, I think, are big achievements, and what they represented over the comic book movie landscape is that these things are not just going to be big, big movies like X-Men was. These things are going to be juggernauts. They are one of the big reasons why we have all these great comic book movies that we're getting excited about, like this weekend with Batman versus Superman. Schnepp? Yeah, I quote Meatloaf, because two out of three ain't bad. I'm with you on that. <laughs> well, um, guys, Meatloaf, yeah. it's always yeah, great. Show. You we need to get into the building. Like out of hell, son. Yeah, um, yeah you know, we're, we're all metalheads here. So yeah. anyway, yeah, Spider-Man 3, I didn't hate it. It's not a great film. It has some good moments. It's just way too many villains, and it's very uneven. I agree. Like, the Sandman setup was great. I thought that would have worked perfectly. I like the black suit symbiote with him having that black outfit. They should have saved Venom for Spider-Man 4. They just tried to cram way too much in there, and they tried to bring it the Green Goblin, you know, the son of the Green Goblin in, and he looked like a like a weird kind of like mm. sports racer guy or something. None of that. Speed really, racer. Yeah, speed, yeah, it was yeah. just weird. But uh, yeah, Spider-Man 1 and 2 are fantastic. I love that Raimi stayed true to the old Stan Lee, Steve Ditko, but updated it enough so it didn't feel like it was tired or old. It just felt really cool and refreshing to see, and it was bright and fun. And McGuire was great as Spider-Man. He, he was great as Peter Parker. So I love those first two films. The third one, unfortunately, didn't nail it. So. Yeah, Spider-Man fans will do anything for love, but they won't do Spider-Man 3. Josh, <laughs> oh, what do you got? Yes! Uh, I, I watched the first one by the dash board lights um, oh, yeah. and so I uh, see what I did there you're three welcome. meatloaf <laughs> sitting on a tree <laughs> um, <laughs> again I was uh, when I first moved to Los Angeles they if spider-man 3 was just being released and I was on the Sony lot and there was spider-man 3 everything and I was such a big fan of one and two uh, that you know that was like the really the reintroduction of superhero movies because we had gone through this like dark ages of of the even though I love the Phantom with Billy Zane, we we had saw we Ooh, saw like Smash Evil. Yeah, we we just saw like some weird incantations of superhero movies, uh, like from Tim Burton's Batman, then we you know Batman and Robin, all that kind of stuff. So Spider Man brought us back to the thing. Where it was like, oh man, these are awesome because he was so good and Tobey Maguire. But then he like he I feel like he almost mailed it in acting wise in three, mm. and Venom is, if you guys don't read the comics, Venom is one of the greatest characters villain characters in a lot of those comic books it's like in uh, Link the second Zelda movie when you have to fight your shadow at the end that's Venom mm. and it's a dark Spider-Man and it's a really dark tone and they took it in a weirdly light tone and that was unfortunate in Spider-Man 3. Dennis? Yeah I, I thought the first one was good I think it was solid it was yeah like you said bouncing back from some of those bad superhero comic book movies and the second one brought it up to another level was was very very excellent and then you had uh the dr octopus I, I didn't alfred expect, molina yeah i yeah. didn't expect that story to be so compelling yeah. and so we were all on that high thinking oh the third one's gonna be great it's got venom in it he sam rainey he knows what he's doing and then we watched it and it was like okay what am i i mean i just remember being in the theater and seeing that emo Peter Parker dancing, and I was like, "What movie am I in?" <laughs> right? Like, I it almost felt like they decided to change and do a different movie at that point. So, yeah, that's kind of the thing that everyone remembers instead of the the, the first two. That's right. A lot of people right now in the chat board celebrating the greatness of Spider-Man Two, not so much Spider-Man Three. And now people remember that Billy Zane was in a Phantom movie. Our next <laughs> Twitter question is: Ico writes, "What two actors have you mixed up because of their looks?" Dylan, Dylan McDermott and Dermot Mulroney. Uh, <laughs> those names are tough. Bill Paxton, too. Bill Pullman, for sure. <laughs> That's really good, too. His name wise. Yeah. Jeffrey Dean Morgan and Javier Bardem. They look <laughs> that, the same yeah. until they start talking, and you're like, oh, okay. 
I actually have made that mistake yeah. multiple times. Yeah, I also thought Max von Cita was dead, so sorry about that. <laughs> oh. Schnapp, who you got? I don't have anybody. How about Jessica Chastain <laughs> and Bryce Dallas Howard? Ooh. They're very similar with the redhead kind of thing, both like intense women that are in really good movies. Amy Adams, Isla Fisher, I constantly. Yeah, oh, yeah those two. Yeah. Constantly. That's yeah. a good one. All right, what's up next? Calvin Duncan writes, a movie most people and critics love, but that you hated. A movie that most critics love that I hated. By the way, somebody just wrote Topher Grace and Mark Ellis. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> a movie that most critics hated that I loved, or, or a movie that most critics loved and I hated. Loved and you hated. Ah, man. Um, I, I, I think that I really liked the movie Drive, but it seems like people worship that movie with Ryan Gosling in it, and I thought that the first five minutes were incredible, and then the movie just kind of lost me after a while. I still liked the movie, but it just was those movies. It was one of those movies that everybody was talking about. And I was like, again, explain to me why this is great. So maybe I'm a mm -hmm. dope. That's probably the case. But I just didn't see the greatness in Drive. I saw that it was a good movie. Uh, another one like that where it's not that I hated the movie, but I just thought it was good versus excellent. And it won, it won an Oscar was Hurt Locker. I watched it and I thought, I thought it was well directed, but some of the dialogue wasn't that great. And some of the scenes I, I didn't care for. And, and also I had seen something around the same similar subject matter that I thought was a lot better, which is uh, Generation Kill by David Simon mm, yeah, on HBO. Cool, sure. yeah. And then watching Hurt Locker, I was like, okay, this is good, but I, I don't know why everyone was praising it so much. Here's one that's going to cause a lot of controversy. I can't even remember what it's called. It won an Oscar. It was animation this year. What was it? You guys Inside all loved out? it? Inside Out. I'm with you on that I one, just man. did not like it. I thought it was real simple. And uh, very, it very just simple. was like, hey, isn't the brain a lot more complex than these four things? <laughs> and everyone else has the same four things. Just to me, and I know it, it works for families and kids and a lot of other people but for me it just did not work at all I I'm I mean everybody that has watched me on schmoes or here or whatever knows that I have a very uh, <laughs> off the kilter kind of taste in movies everything that people loves I usually am not super on board with maybe this is I'm just an idiot and I like guilty movie pleasures but the one movie last year that everybody loved like it was the greatest movie of all time. boyhood is not good it's not a good movie. Come on. It's, I liked it. It's Preach. long. Preach. Congratulations. You put a camera on a kid for 12 years. The movie itself is just like, I like emo music and my mom's depressed. Like, give me a freaking break, man. Uh, you know what? Stuck. Maybe when you age six more years, you're going to become a man and figure out why boyhood this was so special. This tell you different. So right? What's up next? King Joker writes, what song do you associate to a movie slash scene? Um, the one that always pops in my head, and I wish it came on the radio more, though it does with some amount of frequency when you have like a good 80s hour, it would be The Power of Love by Huey Lewis. Mm -hmm. There's no way in hell that you cannot think about Back to the Future when The Power of Love comes on. Speaking of Back to the Future, Johnny B. Good, more often than not, when I hear it on the radio, yeah. I don't care if it's Chuck Berry doing it, Marvin? I can see Marty McFly mm. on stage, and then his cousin Marvin Berry yeah. somewhere else hearing this and being like, oh yeah, this, this is I'm gonna okay. rip this off. Yeah. That's right. I'm yeah. Carlos Mencia, no problem. I would um, say almost any Quentin Tarantino movie is like that's burned in like from Reservoir Dogs yeah for me yeah. it's the uh, stuck in the middle the yeah. ear cutting scene yeah. in Reservoir Dogs when you hear that yeah. song I don't even see the the music no. or hear yeah. I, I just, just see, see the scene yeah, him just doing that little dance <laughs> just like it's horrible it's burned in thank you Quentin I know this movie sent Batman down the wrong path, but Seal Kissed by a Rose. I mean, come on. That, that song that's is right. legendary. That's right. The only one that I can think of that's multiple tunes in the same movie that is really going to get me. I guess Forrest Gump does it too. Because Forrest Gump yeah. has so many great classic rock songs. Mm. So if I hear Jackson Brown running on empty, I'm going to think about Forrest running across the country. But I'm also going to say Top Gun has like four <laughs> songs in that right. soundtrack totally. that still get played on the radio with a regular basis. And all of them. Danger Zone, Take My Breath Away, the Top Gun anthem's great. Uh, Mighty Wings by Cheap Trick. Yeah. There's a lot of great a tunes. Lot. And clearly, I'm a fan of 80s movies. Uh, and clearly, we've talked about this before. Dazed and Confused might have one of the greatest soundtracks oh, yeah. of all time. Slow Slow Fog yes, Hat, yeah. Alice yes. Cooper, School's Out. I mean, that is an incredible soundtrack. If you you guys want to know why we like classic rock listen to the days and confused and then everybody wants some comes out yeah. soon. maybe there's a couple good songs on that yeah. soundtrack actually let's do one more twitter question and call it a day okay dylan payton writes why do some films shoot out of order and others don't most, most shoot out of order yeah. shoot most films order. shoot out of order yeah. only once in a while will we'll film for a reason for that maybe the actors or I don't know, uh, the, the way they want to progress the story, they'll shoot in order, but that's so rare. Like the rarest one last year was The Revenant. Mm. 
and that was like shot consecutively over time, and they only shot during golden hour, which put it made it even harder. But yeah. I'm pretty sure that was shot in order. So. Yeah, because I mean, a lot of a lot of times, if you have a movie, like you start out in a restaurant, then you go out to an alley, and then you go back into the restaurant later in the movie, and it's like, well, if you're a production, why don't we just <laughs> we already got the camera set up here? Let's just film all the restaurant crap now. Then we'll get out to the alley and shoot those scenes, okay. and then maybe if you got to go back and do pickups or something like that. But shooting a script in order is very very tough to do. All all budget. And, and scheduling makes it impossible basically to shoot in order. Mm -hmm. The only time you actually shoot in order was when I was making uh, films on my VHS camcorder back in the day and didn't know how right. to edit. Right. You just Flying a race head. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Right, now you go. Yeah, yeah, when I was making films on my camcorder, I still shot out of order and didn't realize I didn't have the <laughs> editing capability. And I was like, damn it, we got all this great coverage and now I don't know how to cut the movie together. I could have been the next Spielberg. I could have been somebody, ladies and gentlemen. Could have been a contender. Well, that's all the time we have for today on Collab movie talk i want to thank everybody behind the scenes and in front of the camera helping us out today shooting these scenes in order first of all dennis zang over there in the corner where can people find you uh just a reminder WonderCon this weekend tv talk today we got the batman v superman stuff coming our daredevil recaps check them out uh you can find me on twitter at think hero or on instagram dennis.tzng Josh Makuga, you host a new show, right? Yeah, guys, big day today. Um, uh, TV talk. We're gonna tr we're gonna air it in the evening every Monday. Uh, you know, hashtag at Collider TV talk. We're gonna talk. It's gonna be a lot like movie talk. Talking a lot of TV news because there is a ton of TV news right now. We're in the golden age of television. You guys asked for this show, and I'm so so excited to. Uh, to be a part of it, to host it, and to really bring it to life. So. A lot of TV, a lot of Netflix, a lot of Hulu stuff yep. on there. It all counts in TV talk. How about Mr. John Schnepp? You guys can follow me on Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnepp. Check out my Kickstarter. It's a movie called Sweaties Unite, Rise of the Uber Nerd. It's all about comic books and how do we unite all of us sweaties. So check it out on Kickstarter. It's better to fade out than fade away. <laughs> the Rock of Ages by John Schnepp and Ashley Mova. Can you quote Def Leppard? Not at all. Oh, <laughs> you guys can find me on Twitter and on Instagram at Ashley Mova. Happy Monday, guys. Somebody pour some sugar on all of us. Yeah. My name is Mark Ellis. Don't forget, guys, that you can check out the movie Trivia Schmodown airs on Collider Video this Friday, John Campia versus Dan Merle. Tweet us this week. Start right now and hashtag Schmodown because Ashley Mova is going to read some of your tweets live on air. Don't reference Def Leppard. She's going to have no idea <laughs> what you're talking about. Do you think Dan's going to win? Do you think John's going to win? Let us know right now. And remember, there's plenty of great movies playing both right now and in theaters this weekend, Batman and Superman. So yes. get your tickets at amctheaters.com and go there for all the latest box office showtime information. Bookmarkcollider.com. That's the website where you can go check out all the latest in the world of movies as well subscribe right here collider video on youtube my name is mark i'll be at wondercon this weekend we're doing a meet and greet saturday night see you guys then Pour some sugar sugar on on me. if you like this video click the thumbs up button also make sure you subscribe to our youtube channel it'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at collider